Each year, the world sheep produce between two to three million tons of wool. And it takes a lot longer than you may think to go from this to this. The Pendleton Mills receive about 8,000 pounds of freshly shorn wool from around the world each day. Marshall, welcome to Pendleton Wool Mills in Washougal, Washington. The first thing they do with a fresh batch of wool is dye it into one of thousands of colors they use in their fabrics. Workers load 500 pounds of fleece into a five-foot steel basket. Where this hydraulic press uses water and pressure to compact it. Compacting the wool allows them to dye more at one time and preserve resources. Once it's compressed, it's ready for the dyeing process. A crane lifts the basket and slowly lowers it into a giant pressurized vat called a dye cure. A computer triggers the release of dye from tanks above into the cure. They add the dye chemicals and 1,200 gallons of hot water. The nice thing about wool is that it's hydrophilic. It loves water, and what that means for us is that wool will hold on to its color for a really long time. After three to four hours, fresh water pumps in to rinse out excess dye. Then the wool moves into the centrifuge. Here, a quick spin cycle removes most of the water. But the newly colored wool is still pretty damp. So it's on to Pendleton stock dryer. Though this is nothing like your dryer at home. This is a gigantic microwave oven that they use to remove the remaining moisture from the wool. The reason why they use microwaves instead of heat is the same reason you wouldn't put your fine woolens into the dryer. Heat can damage the wool fibers and also shrink them. By using microwaves, they preserve the quality of the wool. As the wool heats up in the microwave, water evaporates off of it and is sucked away through an internal vacuum system. Once dried, the wool falls off the edge of the conveyor and gets sucked away. At this stage, the wool is like hair that's never been brushed. So before it can turn into yarn, it needs to be untangled. That happens in the carding machine. Here, the wool passes through over 100 rollers of various sizes that basically brush it out. Each of the carding machine's rollers is covered with thousands of tiny metal wires. These wires catch the wool and pass it through the machine, brushing the fibers into a uniform direction, just like a giant hairbrush. The result is a wide strip of parallel wool fibers called a web. Finally, a condenser in the carding machine splits the web into 96 individual strands called roving. Each strand winds onto a spool as it exits the machine. The stuff on these spools may look like yarn, but it's not. It doesn't have any strength at all. The amazing thing is that you can give it strength simply by twisting it. That's what this spinning machine is doing. Workers load strands of roving into a spinning frame. A 
As the strands then feed through the machine, a spindle twists each strand at least four times per inch. The more it's twisted, the stronger the yarn. The twisted yarn winds onto spools called bobbins. Each bobbin is actually one long piece of twisted yarn. And this piece is in danger of untwisting. So workers quickly transport the bobbins to the steam box. Here, 200 degree Fahrenheit water vapor causes the fibers in the yarn to lock together keeping them twisted in place. Now the yarn is finally ready to become fabric. And it all starts here, in the weaving room. Wool fabric is essentially made of two parts, vertical yarn called warp and horizontal yarn called weft. The intersection of the warp and weft provides the base pattern for the fabric. To begin the weaving process, hundreds of warp threads spin onto a roller simultaneously. But as the yarn is wound around the roller, it is in constant danger of snapping. All of these threads form a very precise pattern, and if any one of the threads breaks, the pattern's destroyed. That's where these little loops come in. If a thread breaks, the loop falls, shuts the machine down completely, lights this red light so the operator can retie that thread, and then everything starts up again. Once a roller is completely loaded with warp, it heads here. It works a lot like a hand loom. Its job is to pull horizontal threads between the warp yarn. It's a lot more complicated than it sounds. Each piece of warp yarn is pulled off of the beam and through one of a series of harnesses. Levers called dobbies raise some of the harnesses while lowering others. Then, tiny metal fingers called rapiers pass a strand of weft yarn back and forth through the warp yarn. Every time a piece of weft crosses the warp, it's called a pick. With each pick, the machine takes turns lifting alternate strands of warp yarn. This creates a woven fabric. The loom moves fast, six to eight picks per second. But if you slow it down, you can see it draw across a single pick. With each pick, the fabric grows. Once the fabric's complete, it's on to the finishing department for a special treatment designed just for wool. And later, find out what your size and weight have to do with how your car's airbags perform. Now that we've seen how wool turns from sheep fleece into fabric, there's one last crucial step before it's ready for sale. This is a fulling mill. It's like a giant washing machine. They fill it with about a thousand pounds of fabric and then hit it with warm water and soap. Rollers move the fabric through the soapy mixture. 
then force it through a narrow tunnel. The combination of abrasion, water, and soap shrinks the wool up to 25%, making it softer and smoother. The fabric exits the fulling mill ready to be squeezed, dried with hot air, and steamed to release any tension. Finally, workers trim the fabric to the right size and ship it out to keep people warm all over the world.